Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everyone and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para-X Radio Network. Tonight's opening song was The Apparition by Midnight Syndicate. And that's exactly what my guest tonight, Bernie Coppell, saw many years ago an apparition, and not a pretty one either. He told the tale on Celebrity Ghost Stories, and we'll be talking about his unnerving experience in just a couple of minutes. Now, Bernie is known for a variety of names and faces. He was Dr. Adam Bricker on the hit TV series The Love Boat, the notorious chaos agent Siegfried on TV's Get Smart. He was Jerry Bowman on Batgirl, and the 100-year-old witch's apothecary on Bewitched. But his list of credits and character names go on and on. And with so many aliases, it's a wonder he even knows who he is from one minute to the next. But I'm pretty sure the real Bernie is with us tonight. And just to make sure, I'm going to ask a question that only the real Bernie would have an answer to. So it's an acting question, Bernie, and here goes. When actors prepare for roles, they sometimes need to learn a craft so that their characterizations might be more believable. Like if you're being cast as a cowboy, some might need to take riding lessons. Or to portray a policeman, they might have to do ride-alongs with real policemen to get a feel for the job. So how does one train to become an extremely lecherous 100-year-old apothecary? Well, that was on Bewitched. On Bewitched, uh, it was a party. It, it had the feeling, because of Elizabeth Montgomery being such a delectable, sweet <laughs> seductive girl it was a party and you you said okay how would i do this at a party um of course i'm i was not uh, i was not a hundred year old uh, at the time but i said i'll just have some fun with it talk like an older man and uh, keep chasing uh, chasing ladies around my little apothecary shop of course we don't use the word apothecary anymore we use drugstore uh, <laughs> It was just, it was fun. It was just a feeling of fun at a party. And Elizabeth was, was the, the hostess at a party. And she always gave you the feeling that let's have a good time. Let's enjoy ourselves. And that's what it was on that set all the time. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, um, you know, watching, I, I went back this week and I was kind of looking at some of the old clips here and there. And... I watched a clip of you chasing Elizabeth around the apothecary shop, and I I started to chuckle because the rehearsals for that scene must have been grueling. And yes, I'm being facetious. Well, good. Facetious is almost is almost comedic, so that's a nice thing. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It was Alice Ghostly who I was chasing. Alice Ghostly. uh, When Alice Ghostly acted and Paul Lind acted, you. You never saw the both of them at the same time. 
<laughs> they were very, very similar in their in their speech patterns. You know, mm-hmm. Paul. Uh, I did a number of uh, Hollywood squares, and Paul had that great line uh, where the officer the officer stops him and he says when he's driving and he says, "Okay, pull over. Where's the fire?" And Paul Lynn said, "In your eyes, officer. In your eyes." <laughs> But uh, he was a character. I kind of like the story that you told me once, and it's not telling tales out of school at all, but you had been working with Paul on Bewitched, and then you both ended up on The Flying Nun at the same time. Well, we were not on The Flying Nun. We did The Flying Nun, but it was very hard to be on her. Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there's no seatbelts, right? But she was thinking of all the Academy Awards she would win subsequently. (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, I said Paul was there, and I, and I was I was playing a, a, a dentist, Doctor Paredes, from uh, from Puerto Rico, and uh, I saw Paul, and I said I knew his reaction. I said, Paul, hi, Paul, are you happy to see me? And he said, No, <laughs> Just, no. <laughs> well, he was honest, wasn't he? At least. <laughs> Yeah, I and mean, you got to kind of like that, you know, somebody that can be. Now, well, you, actually, he was—he huh? was not—he was not a comfortable man. He was not—he was not comfortable with his with his uh, sexuality. Let me put it that way. And uh, when he'd had it, when he'd had a drink, it was—he just started attacking people, and uh, it was unfortunate because he was a talented man. Yes, uh, yes. he was—he had great humor, but. Uh, when we'd have a, a, a Christmas party or a rap party on Bewitched, he'd come in, he'd have a few drinks, and everybody would say, okay, get out of the way. Paul is <laughs> here. He's had a drink. Mm. Unfortunate, but that's what it was. Yeah, well, at least she could see it coming. Yeah. Now, now, you've been blessed by having worked with many, many, many beautiful women over the years, and oh, some yeah. of... Oh, some yeah. of... <laughs> some oh, yeah. who been made up not to look so beautiful as well. But in real life, many years ago, you can like the segue, you had a run-in with the ghost of a woman who at one time might have been quite beautiful, but when she appeared to you, she was quite disturbing. And you spoke about it on Celebrity Ghost Stories. So how did that come about? Well, Marla, this was a very unusual and frightening time uh, in my life. I was helping talk about upstate New York. Uh, My father-in-law worked for a Niagara Mohawk as an electrician, but uh, he was retired and he also did odd jobs. So we were at the Red Coach Inn. He said, you know, Bernie, he says, come on along with me. Uh, We got to do some spackling and painting and the, the manager doesn't want people doing this during the day. So we're going to be doing it after midnight when most people are asleep and we won't make any noise. We're just doing some spackling and, and painting. Mm-hmm. Well, we're doing, we're doing our work. We're doing our work. Uh, we're into it for about an hour and a half. And all of a sudden, a specter comes out of a wall. This was near the ladies' room. Just materializes out of a wall mm. and... Her, you looked at her head, and this this is <clears throat> this was a ghost. You know, some people say, "Oh, there's no such thing." We saw this. We mm-hmm. saw this, and it was terrifying. She came out of the wall, and her head was not a normal head. It had been somehow disfigured. And as I looked closer, she kept coming toward us. It looked as though it had been bashed in wow and she just kept coming forward and and i looked at my father-in-law and he and well the first thing that happened is the door he, he came there with we, we came there with with his uh, collie mm-hmm. and before even before she appeared the collie started uh, that growl that 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 collie that dogs do because dogs sense everything before we do sure and he ran down the hall toward the toward the exit, and then she came in. So he was he was aware of some thing, and she was the thing. She kept coming toward us, looking with just she had one useful eye, mm. 
And she looked at us, and then I think I found out later what why she was looking. She was looking for the man who had bashed her head in, and she realized that it was not Earl, my father-in-law, or myself, mm-hmm. and she went right back in through the wall and disappeared. Now, the following day, we came back, you know, very frightened. We came back to the, to the Red Coach Inn, which is right in Niagara Falls, and he said, was there something unusual uh, years ago uh, that happened here because Niagara Falls are the place where people go to their honeymoon. They have a loving, a loving, a sensual, sexy time on their honeymoon. And, and there's a, a legend that the water, the rushing water, sort of activates your, your sensuality. And I don't know if that's true, but if people believe that, then, uh, then they can act upon that. But there was some kind of a disagreement in their, in their suite. And what happened was, and this is totally terrifying, people are supposed to be loving, what happened was he was upset with something she had done or said. He picked up a candelabra and started bashing and bashing and bashing her head, and he killed her. And the way the story goes, her, her ghost is constantly looking for her bridegroom who killed her. And if that's not terrifying, I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah. And you have to feel sorry for her because look how she's living. She never, I don't know your belief system about after you pass where you go, but... You know, if you do go to the light and go to the other side, she's earthbound. She keeps looking and looking and looking, and that's got to be very hard. Yeah, she's looking for she's looking for the man who killed her. And the irony is, on a honeymoon, you're supposed to be having the best time of your life. <laughs> yeah, but uh, apparently, it didn't work out that way. Mm, mm. Oh, really, really. That's yeah. that's really scary. Um, have you had any other experiences like that since then, or is that like the one and only? Well, since then, I had a call back to the Red Coach Inn, and a psychic lady was there on the haunting, mm-hmm. and we went to the same spot where this occurrence happened, and there was more discussion, and it was very moving at one time. The, the, I, I don't remember what, what the psychic said to me, but mm-hmm. something triggered a great sadness between my, myself and my father. Mm-hmm. We, did, we did not have the most harmonious relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she asked a question about it. I wish I could remember it, but I, I, it, it just it, it escaped my, my, my mind. Mm-hmm. But uh, it made me cry. Mm-hmm. And now I'm 81, and I was I was 80 at the time. I said, "Gee whiz, this must have been some kind of a powerful thought." I can't imagine what it was because it's it's escaped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, see, I I for some reason would have thought because I mean we've worked together. I know you. You're not a total stranger. Um, for some reason, I thought you'd kind of poo poo mediums and readings and things like that. I did. Marla, I did until I had this experience. Uh huh. I did. I said, come on, this is kind of a con job. Uh, you know, it, it, to me, it was, it was a silly thing. It was a, a scam. It was, and then I experienced this in my life. And uh, although it was terrifying, I said, well, okay. Uh, I can't fight this. I experienced it. Mm-hmm. It happened. I wasn't dreaming. And uh, there it was. So mm-hmm. there is, I mean, pe- people think, well, you, well, maybe it was your imagination. It might have been. I don't think it was my imagination because both, three beings saw, saw this. The dog, and they sense everything. Yes. My father-in-law and myself. 
Mm-hmm. And the dog ran like hell. <laughs> Smart dog. Yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm glad for that. I just, you know, when I was reading about um, the medium and stuff, it just kind of struck me that, wow, I wonder how that went. And I, I actually looked to see on the Internet if there was um, anything about that. There was some of her shows on there, but I couldn't find that one because I wanted to see it. it. It really did interest me. But um, I think that's how a lot of people get into the metaphysical side of life, not by hearsay, but by happening. By the actual experience. By the actual experience. Because no one would believe, well, such and such a thing happened. uh, And uh, people have a great disbelief about things like that. But Mm -hmm. if you are immersed in that experience, Mm -hmm. you say, okay, all right. I felt this, I sensed it, it was there, and I just take it off the dog. If the dog sensed it, you know, they have, they have the most extraordinary uh, f- feelings. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they sense earthquakes before they happen. Mm-hmm. They, sense, they sense tragic things. They sense happy things. Uh, they're very emotional uh, beings, dogs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, um, you know, I don't know how many people know, but you are a very big animal person. Um, have a great love of all things furry and, and winged, right? Ever since I was a kid, I have had a, a love affair with dogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the first one, I don't know how old I was. I may have been uh, 10 or 11. Uh, my father used to take me to the fights. We came out of St. Nicholas Arena in, in New York City. You know, that place was such, the place in itself was such a character. It had that smell of stale beer and <laughs> the cigar smoke. And uh, my father and I came out and we saw this little blonde cocker spaniel. A guy was walking his dog. So uh, the dog just seemed to have some kind of an affinity for me. And I just went right over to the dog and uh, went back and forth. And, you know, I learned that you put your hand out, let the dog smell your hand. If you Mm -hmm. smell like a good guy or a bad guy, and I guess I smelled like a good guy. (laughs) And uh, my father got into a conversation with this fella. And he said, uh, what would you take to, uh, what would it take to, uh, to give us the dog, to, would you would you sell the dog? And I got back and forth. My father was very persuasive. My father ended up buying the dog for twenty five bucks. Oh. Well, we took the dog home, and my sister, who was three and a half years younger than I, that dog, whose name was Bonnie, became the queen of our <laughs> home. Oh. We walked her. We, the people stopped and they wanted to touch her. And I said, okay, just put your hand out, let her smell your hand. Mm-hmm. And we were very proud just going around with, with the dog. Well, for a year or so, uh, Bonnie was the queen of our mm. home. She was so beautiful. She, had, she was blonde and she had what you call feathers coming up between her, between her, uh, her paws. And mm-hmm. she, her chest came out. It was like uh, combed together and... And uh, it, had, it had feathers. He was so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And one day, she was not feeling very well. And she kept getting sicker and sicker. Mm-hmm. And we were beside ourselves. And my father took her to the, uh, the veterinarian. Mm-hmm. And he was sort of hedging around. He said, we'd like to, can we see Bonnie? We were so upset. He said, no, better, better that you don't, better that you don't see Bonnie. We've got to see her, we've got to see her. We persuaded him to bring Bonnie home. Bonnie had contracted distemper. Oh. And she was in, uh, he brought her home in a corrugated box. And her eyes were wide, her non-seeing eyes were wide and she'd shriveled. And she was having spasms, and eventually she died. Mm. This was so devastating Mm -hmm. for my little sister and myself. But uh, 
it never stopped me from loving dogs. Now there was one other dog thing that happened. There was a a um, an Irish setter. Mm -hmm. Now, some people with red hair, you may say, well, red hair may not be the most attractive uh, color on, on, a woman's, uh, on a woman's head. But the Irish setter red mm -hmm. is so rich and so beautiful mm -hmm. that I fell in love with this Irish setter. At the same time, there was a lady who, was, who had the same color hair. And I said, I fell in love with her also. <laughs> so I was just in love with a dog and a lady at the same time. Of course, I was maybe 11 years old. But uh -huh. um, it's a beautiful, beautiful color. Mm -hmm. And the, the Irish setter is a, is a stunning, stunning animal. At one time, I had as many as six, six uh, dogs. <laughs> and, uh, that was enough for a while. Now well, I'm down to one. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Well, I was I was just as you were saying that, just remembering um, a dog that almost got you thrown off the love boat, and well, his name was we Lucky. Were, uh, little Lucky, little Lucky, or as we say in Espanol, Suertulo. Suertulo. <laughs> we had uh, we docked into uh, in Malaga, Malaga, Spain, and there was a great reception during the love boat, the hot, hot love boat days. So we were, we were, there were limos to take us to Marbella, maybe the, one of the great parties, uh, places in, in the world. Uh, and it allegedly has one of the best climates in the world, Marbella. So mm -hmm. as we're getting in, we're being ushered into these, um, into the limos. We see this little doggy. A little doggy is begging for food with one paw up. And I think a lady was giving him a piece of ham, and he had the one palm. I said, God, the guy looks so cute. So then we're in the limos, and we go to Marbella, and we come back hours later, and we're kind of high from the, from the great, uh, lovely Spanish wines, and the dog is still there. Well, we were just insanely high enough to say, let's take him on the ship. <laughs> we took him on the ship like, like blithering idiots. And uh, we, I, I thought he was gray and uh, gray and brown spots. We, we took him into our cabin and uh, we gave him a bath. And he said, he wasn't gray. He was white, but he was filthy. <laughs> so th then we, we said, what, he's got some kind of bumps on, on his back and on his, on his belly. They were, um, what do you call those little, uh, uh, oh, Golly, what do you call those uh, ticks? Oh, yeah. He had ticks. Mm. So I started to pull them off, and, and one of my friends said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't pull them off. Just take a lit cigarette and hold it to his back, and that way he'll pull his, his little claws out, and you can pick them out like that. So we got all, all of those out. Now, before you know it, Everybody on the ship is knocking on the door. I said, oh, gee, I hope it's not the captain because it's a, completely illegal to do this. Mm -hmm. so, no, so it was nurses, waiters, waitresses, uh, doctors. Everybody is bringing food for the little doggy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was eating his face off. Now, the big problem was after a day, he was not going to the bathroom. So uh, Audrey Landers and, uh, and Judy Landers' mother said, I know what to do. I know exactly what to do. I had some friends in the circus, and she said, you take a match. Don't light the match. You take a match and insert it in the dog's anus. And the dog is ready, very anxious to get rid of the, of the match, so he will push it out, thereby having a movement. Well, we tried that. He was not very happy about that. Uh, it didn't work. We said, well, what the heck are we going to do now? Maybe, well, oh, we'll, we'll try an, uh, a fleet enema. So uh, we called, the, uh, we called the, the sick bay, and they said, uh, we, uh, we, 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 would like, we would like an enema. So, so <laughs> I feel I was playing Doc 
So, so the, the nurses there said, oh, wonderful. We'd better just send Mr. Coppell up and we'll give him this enema. Oh, they said, no, 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 Mr. Coppell is shy. He doesn't want, he doesn't want this uh, in, in a public way. Just can, 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 uh, my wife said, can you just go, can, I, can we go to the infirmary and get it? Uh, well, we got it. We tried it. The end was really too big. Nothing happened. Now, this is three days. He's eating his face off, and he's not going to the bathroom. So one night, I think on the fourth day, we're so concerned that the dog might explode. <laughs> we took him up to one deck and another deck, and may I report to you that finally it happened on the poop deck. <laughs> it happened. And we sent, you know, uh, congratulatory messages throughout the ship. It's okay. He went to the bathroom. Uh-huh. And um, he went home with you when you got back he into port. Home. He was, uh, although first, first we went to a Monaco. We bought him, he was, he, we bought him this beautiful leash and collar. And we marched him into the Hotel de Paris and he was like the king of the mountain, just walking. He was a little, he was sort of a, a, a Cavalier King Charles mix. Beautiful mm-hmm. little uh, puppy with an underslung jaw, big, beautiful eyes. And uh, he had a bit of an attitude, I must say. I, I t- we took him on the Merv Griffin show, and Merv loved doggies. And uh, he was, Merv was brilliant with the dog. And mm-hmm. it was great fun. Anyway, uh, Lucky or Suertudo lived a full, healthy life. He lorded it over the other dogs here. And uh, <laughs> that's the lucky story. Mm, I love the lucky story because he yeah, was, well, you were both lucky. He was lucky yeah. and you were lucky too. Uh, very lucky. Mm. Now, I think it's safe to say that the two roles that people identify you most with on television were Siegfried on Get Smart and Adam Bricker on The Love Boat. But even with those two big hits, your versatility as an actor um, never allowed you to be typecast. I mean, I don't know how many people realize, for example, that not only did you play the apothecary on Bewitched, you also played a blonde hippie warlock named Alonzo, a Viennese psychiatrist, and a German submarine captain. So part of that versatility, I think, has to do with your talent with dialects. How did that develop? It developed in a very peculiar way. I was driving a taxi. I was not an overnight success. I was driving a taxi in Los Angeles and very disheartened because I had an agent who was, I would, I would categorize him as being slow. He was <laughs> slow. He would send me up for parts that had already been cast. That was slow. Of course, my agent is slow and uh, I expect this sort of thing. And I was walking out just so disheartened. And she says, wait, wait, Bernie, but before you go, would you like to read for Pablo? And I'm saying to myself, is this life is putting me on? Life is just giving me spears through the heart because on my way in, I had seen five guys who could have been Jesus or Pablo or Juan or Jose. I got mm-hmm. so pissed. I was just furious. I said, okay, okay, I'll read for Pablo. I didn't know if I could, but I thought my heart is racing away, racing away. I said, okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Jack Parr has a, uh, a, a pianist. His name is Jose Melis, and Jose Jimenez is, is on. I'll, I'll do them. I didn't know if I could. Mm-hmm. I go to the office. Buzz Blair is the producer. I nail it. I nail it. Now, three months of my life, I'm playing Pablo, who's a, he's a mean guy. He's threatening ladies. He's pushing blind ladies around. And uh, this, was, this was a huge breakthrough for me. And mm-hmm. I, just, I, could do, I could do this, uh, this accent. So my first five years in the business was nothing but a Latino, a Cuban, a Mexican, a Puerto Rican. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is... Very unusual, but it's great fun, great fun. Now, Mm -hmm. of course, you know, it's politically incorrect to do this sort of thing because, you know, people of ethnicity uh, get a little annoyed when anybody else tries to. It's like if if it's a part of an Indian, 
uh, you have to be, it has to be played by an Indian. It's a Puerto Rico, it has to be played by, by a Latino. And I, I applaud that and I salute it that people stood up and took a political stand and said, that's enough of that, having other people uh, steal, our, steal our parts. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I did, you know, actors are, are, are opportunists. You do what's available to you, and that's, that's what sure. I did. That's mm-hmm. what I did. Great fun. And that kind of snowballed also into Siegfried, and, and it seems like um, you were almost the go-to guy for the casting directors um, early, early on, and it, it continued on for the longest time, right? Marla, this started for me in, in um, uh, 1966. I had done a play where I had the great, great, great pleasure of being paid for the first time in this little, little hole in the wall, 158-seat theater, uh, and the first time I was paid in 62. I was, um, it was a very sweet little play uh, about an immigrant coming to the United States from the Ukraine and in the freezing Buffalo weather, you can tell Tim, Buffalo, <laughs> freezing Buffalo winter, selling the misnamed fruit fluters. It's something you, s- you screw into a potato and it makes a kind of a ribbon. So it's door to door in freezing Buffalo. And it's just a very sweet play. Uh, the the home I was knocking on the door on was was the home of a of an eye doctor. His pretty daughter opens the door. Eventually, we fall in love. Uh, there's a funny scene where he thinks I'm a patient, and he gives me an eye exam, uh, and I just sort of go along with it. But anyway, Leonard Stern, Leonard Stern. Mm-hmm turned out to be my great mentor and friend for 47 years before he passed away. Uh, he came to see it. Very distinguished man, a uh, very tall man, uh, dressed beautifully. He had a little beard. He had a mustache. He came backstage to this little hole looking for me, and he found me, and he said, uh, we're going to work together. We're going to work together. And I just thought it was more Hollywood BS because mm-hmm. with my experience with uh, authority figures, there was just a lot of, a lot of baloney. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but the first thing he did about three years later, he said, um, got a series here. It's called Run, Buddy, Run, and uh, we'd like you to play the lead. Now, when somebody says something like this, when somebody in an in, in authority position says this, it's a bit of heaven because auditioning, although it is an opportunity to audition, is also frustrating and painful because most of the time you don't get the damn job. <laughs> so anyway, okay, so now for eight months of my life, I'm having meetings with David Susskind, with, with Leonard Stern, with Dan Melnick. We're going to Scandia. We're going to La Scala. We're going to all these fancy, wonderful places. And uh, it's like heaven. It's heaven. And I'm saying, well, any time now we're going to start. So I'm in New York. My father was, was dying. And I get a call to go into the talent associate's office into, um, into um, one of the, one of the uh, producer's uh, offices. And uh, he's on the phone. When I finally get in there, after waiting for about 40 minutes, uh, Dan Melnick, and he says, he's on the phone. He says, uh, Harry, oh, as I, he's waving me into the office. He says, Harry, this will only take a second. He said, and he, he puts his hand over the, over the phone, and he says, Bernie, I'm sorry, sweetheart, you're out of the sketch, so have a drink, go home, have a nap. And he waves me off. And he said, yeah, Harry, and he waves me out, and I'm out. I'm out of the sketch. It was a very depressing time for me. Sure. But uh, within one year, Leonard calls, and he says, can you do a German accent? And I say, yes. <laughs> that so full of it that they say yes before the question is even completed. Mm-hmm. Can you do a German accent? Yes, I can. <laughs> 
And that was the beginning of my five years on Get Smart. Uh, it was, I was 33. It was heaven. I, that's the only way I can describe it. Don Adams, as opposed to so many stars, uh, was embracing. He, he was uh, responsive to me. I was always worried because some stars that I'd worked with had an attitude of, hey, you set me up, I get to laugh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don wasn't like that. Don wasn't, as a matter of fact, in one, in one episode, he imitated my, my accent. Uh, yeah. So it was just the, the, the most pleasant time and taking a chance on this was a comedy of anger, a comedy of contempt and superciliousness. And um, I, had, I remember in the, in the submarine, we were chasing the Sixth Fleet in the submarine, and I had captured Don Adams and Barbara Feldon. Mm-hmm. Chasing them because we wanted to torpedo the Sixth Fleet. And mm. in response, they were dropping depth bombs very close to our submarine. And the men were getting frantic and were getting very nervous. And I said to my men, you will not panic until I give the order to panic. <laughs> and a depth bomb came within feet of the submarine, shaking it tremendously from side mm-hmm. to side. And I said to the men, prepare to panic. <laughs> and that was one of the, uh, the happier <laughs> moments. <laughs> Our biggest problem on Get Smart was getting through scenes with Barbara and Don and not cracking up because it was so damn funny to us. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful experience. That makes it perfect. And okay, so now I think it's interesting that when The Love Boat first appeared, the critics predicted that the show was going to sink like the Titanic. And yet. The show lasted 10 years, was seen in some 97 countries, and to this day has not lost his charm. And somebody earlier today told me that today on I don't know what channel, there was a Love Boat Marathon. So it can still be seen all over the place. Now, why do you think they panned it from the get-go and were so wrong? Well, critics are a questionable uh, bunch of people. Uh, uh Diana Rigg, who I had the pleasure of working with, we had scenes in bed, woohoo, with Diana <laughs> Rigg, who was, uh, was uh, Miss, uh, Miss Peel on uh, what the heck show was the she? The Avengers, on? was the it? The Avengers, thank you, Marla. Um, she had a compilation of the crappiest reviews you could imagine for performances by Laurence Olivier. Sir Ralph Richardson, um, uh, John Gielgud, uh, the, the greatest actors in the world had some really, really, hope I don't, you don't mind if I say really shitty reviews. Not at all. In a way, it's sort of irrelevant because what, what does matter, by the way, it was, it was not all the critics, it was just the, the darling critic from the 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 uh, drama section or the television section from the L.A. Times who said, it's going to sink like the Titanic. <laughs> not encouraging, my dear, not encouraging. No. So, but the, the people loved it. It was in 97 countries or 98 countries. Uh, people loved it because it didn't hurt anybody. It was certainly not cutting-edge drama. It was feel-good, feel-good television. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Aaron Spelling had this concept that, you know, people are working hard. They want to come, come home after a hard day's work, have a beer if it's a beer, take their shoes off, sit, and be entertained. Some people called it mind candy. Mm-hmm. And uh, the brilliant comic uh, Dick Sean was watching a scene. Uh, it was, it was, I had this scene with Rebecca Holden, a lot of kissing, a lot of kissing, but it just went, it just went so far. And he was watching uh, intensely off camera, and I come off, and he said, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. He says, yeah, I, just, I just discovered what Love Boat is. It's a porno flick done by Disney. 
<laughs> which is a pretty damn brilliant thing to say because it just went so far, only so it, far. There was lots of innuendo and lots of kind of overt innuendo, um, as I recall. But the main thing I recall about it in general was it was Saturday night. I mean, there was no nothing on TV except The Love Boat followed by Fantasy Island. That was it. That's right, but there was one extraordinarily sexy scene, uh, maybe the sexiest scene on network television at that time between myself and Juliet Prowse. Oh, uh, yes. She was supposed to be an ex-wife, and she comes aboard, and you know, I'd given her 500 bucks for the divorce. I didn't want to bother with it. She gave it to uh, her, her butcher's uh, friend, who was a, a, a half-baked lawyer, so we were never divorced. And I said, oh, crap. No, but of course, we had wonderful, sensual uh, relationship, but we really just couldn't get along on any other level. So <laughs> there was one scene, there was, uh, there was, I mean, I was, I, I was, I had a combination of being intimidated and turned on by Juliet Proud. She was one of the most attractive ladies with the most gorgeous legs you could imagine. Mm-hmm. And for years, and she'd gone with Sinatra, one of my idols, Sinatra. I said, oh, 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 I have scenes with this magic lady. I said, I don't know if I'll be able to get through this. Yeah. So just before the scene in bed, she says, and she was so super cool. She says, you know, now there's 50 people around, the sound department, the camera department, the grips. And I'm saying, I, if I can only get through this without my hairpiece falling off, it'll be a wonderful thing. So <laughs> she says, you know, Charles Boyer had uh, a scene like this with a beautiful leading lady. And I'm saying to myself, why is she saying this to me? We have a scene to do. My God. <laughs> and he said, to what scene? He said to her, you know, darling, if possibly I get, how you say, aroused during this scene. Forgive me, please. And then again, if I don't get aroused, forgive me, please. <laughs> so she was uh, um, one of the delightful human beings. Uh, she even came after a few weeks later, she came up and she said, hey, guys, guess what? I had my tits done. I said, oh. We're so happy about your... Yeah, yeah, she said, I don't have to put Kleenex there anymore. I said, well, that's wonderful. Uh, she, was, <laughs> she was just a delight. She was a delight. And uh, tragically, she died of uh, pancreatic cancer a few years, a few years later. So yeah. Uh, yeah. there's no, no guarantees about anything. But I guess you have to just enjoy people. While you while you have the pleasure of their company, exactly. By the way, by the way, I hear I hear this show is going to so many so many of the countries, most likely of many of the countries that we uh, we were in in, yeah. in our love boat days. Uh, you mentioned the Ukraine and France and England, uh, Japan, China, all over the place. Mm-hmm. So you know, even after the ten years, we did three two-hour specials. And then we did a Love Boat, The Next Wave, where uh, Bob Urich was mm-hmm. the king. And oddly enough, and this is very odd to me, is that show, when the original Love Boat cast uh, was on it, the reviewer said it was a sweet, smartly written episode. And this, I'm, I'm quoting this verbatim, and the mm-hmm. show lasted just a couple of months. So yeah. you never know, you never know, <laughs> even if you get a great review, it could work out uh, badly. So well, maybe, you... I should, maybe I should be thankful for that crappy review that we got, it's going to sink like the Titanic. <laughs> Everything goes in opposites. Well, there, I... there have been so many stories about your travels, um, some, some good ones and bad ones. I mean, you know, Bernie, you could write a book about that, you know? <laughs> Son of a gun, what a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we're going to be doing that shortly. I, I think I almost have it ready because as I go along, my, my imagination just keeps popping up new stuff. I, it's not new, but it's something that had been hidden for a while. 
Mm-hmm. But I said, oh, there's a, there's a whole other thing here that uh, I, could, I can include, and I've done one of those today, uh, mm-hmm. about being in the Navy in the, in the uh, Jim Crow uh, state of Virginia, mm-hmm. where I could, not, I could not go off base with my friend from New York who was, happened to be black, because even though, and this is ironic and horrible, even though in our uniform we were dedicated, we vowed to protect our country with our lives if necessary, and my black friend could not get off the base and have a hamburger at a greasy spoon because he was black. Yeah. These, these horrible injustices just uh, are enough to stop your traffic. So on the mm-hmm. base, it was fine. Uh, we could be back in 1956. I could see movies for 10 cents. I could mm-hmm. watch airplanes uh, take off and land. But off the base, and I had these signs that said, uh, dogs and sailors keep out. <laughs> now, I, I don't like to talk about my heroism in the Navy, but it's okay, I will. <laughs> I was a librarian, mm-hmm. and uh, even though I wore that uniform, some people some people uh, doubt that that was part of the Navy. But I said, "Hey, look, I'm keeping America safe from overdue books." Now, come on, don't give me a break. <laughs> That's uh, almost worthy of a Purple Heart, you know. Oh yeah, or a purple a purple date stamp, anyway. <laughs> yeah, something like that, but. Uh, I had uh, I got the job of librarian at the naval operation at first uh, naval air station in Norfolk, and then uh, naval operation base when I was on the Iowa. I got the same job because a lot of those sailors were not that comfortable around books. Huh. I was very comfortable around books. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, apropos this uh, this sign that said uh, "Dogs and sailors keep out," I had an impulse. I had an impulse to, to take a to take a dignified stand and say, "How dare you say such a thing about about myself and my uniform dedicated to protect this country with my life if necessary?" And then I thought, "Well, I really haven't seen too much action, and uh, I think the closest I got to to um, to war was uh, spending about a week." and a half reading, slogging through, uh, getting battle fatigue, trying to read War and Peace, because <laughs> it's such a big, fat book. Oh, uh, yeah. I was forced to read that at one time, too. I can empathize. That was tough. Actually, was I, loved, I loved the book, uh, but it mm-hmm. was hard, hard to keep track of who was doing who. Yes, uh, exactly. Tolstoy, Tolstoy was a writer, and he really... Uh, he prevailed with, with writing such a brilliant book, uh, but I mean, it was like a dictionary. It was that mm-hmm. fat, and even yes. uh, Don Adams, Don Adams said, "Hey, wait a minute! War and Peace saved my life. Somebody shot me. The bullet went into the book, and it didn't go <laughs> in, into my body. It was just so damn thick." <laughs> Well, you know what? You're like the Energizer Bunny because you're always on the move. You're always acting somewhere or another. And I went over to IMDb the other day and I see that there's a movie you recently completed that's in post-production right now called A Horse Story that'll be out next year. And it it also... It it possibly will possibly uh, be out if the guy who who produced it... um, eventually pays the actors and pays, the, <laughs> and pays the people. This sort of goes back to the old days when, you know, when actors would be stranded. Uh, I said, what, what happened? I said, well, the producer ran away with the money. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a very odd thing. But um, Katrina is very busy, my, my very own personal wife, with, with um, uh, producing and casting now. And Good. she's done... She's done something called Abaddon, a sort of a pre-Hansel and Gretel uh, story, and mm. um, we see we'll see where that goes. But it's certainly uh, it's a fascinating business. I've been in love with it all my life, and I and I'll I'll quote Morgan Freeman, one of the most amazing actors in the world. He said, "I've never worked a day in my life. It's all been play. It's all been fun. 
and that's what it is. If you're lucky enough to work uh, as an actor or as an actor or as an actress, mm-hmm. it's just the great. It's let's let's pretend it's the greatest thing that that uh, you can do if you're talented enough. If you have the if you have the chutzpah enough, um, mm-hmm. like Lenny Kazan said, being in our business is falling in love with the word no, because you get a lot of rejection. But sometimes, if you if you plow through the rejections, you can get some you can get some affirmative answers, and you get a job, which is terrific. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, your job really paid off because all night long I've been watching the chat room. And everybody loves you. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of amazing because I have guests on and people go, oh, great guest, you know, blah, 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 blah. But there's people in the chat room like Nyla, Patsy, and Sherry, and um, I there you go, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and loving me, I need it, I need the love. Yeah, Patsy just said, Marla, one of your best shows ever because I love Bernie Coppell. How do you Yay, like that? Yay, team. I like that. Mm-hmm. So I think down the line we're going to have to have you back if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Because there's a lot of stories to tell. Um, one quick thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about. we got just a couple of minutes. But um, while I was doing my homework for tonight's show, I was poking around for some little-known facts or something because I like to find that stuff out and I was pleasantly surprised to find out that you and your lovely wife Katrina were married on Halloween which is my favorite holiday how did that come about let me correct that Uh, we were not married on Halloween but Adam uh, who is now almost 17 was born on Halloween okay okay see you never believe anything that's on the internet right Right. why why believe that why believe that so we uh, we go out on, on Halloween (laughs) <laughs> it's sort of fun to go out and say, hey, th- this is my birthday, he says. Uh, I was born on this date in, um, what was it, born in 97. Yeah, born in 97. Perfect kidlet, born on Halloween. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah it's kind of amazing. I want to say that um, if people want to find out more about you or get in touch with you, they can go to your website, which is berniecopel.com. And you also have a couple of Facebook pages, I noticed. So um, get the word out if anybody is interested in finding out more and, and what he's up to and what he's doing. Because like I said, he's always on the move. And, you know, Bernie, I was reading an old interview that you did a couple of years ago. And you were talking about attitude of actors a few minutes ago. And lots of people think of actors as being pretentious and snobby. And they think of some of the newcomers that come in with an attitude of entitlement. Um, many of them, of course, haven't put in the years of hard work and made their ascent up the ladder. But you started at the bottom. You worked your way up. You've had a very long, successful career to show for it. And it's still going strong. You don't have a holier-than-thou attitude. And this is this was the, the quote that, that really made me smile. Because you said in that interview that you love what you do. And your attitude is gratitude. And I think that's brilliant. My attitude is gratitude. And not only that, but that there's no reason why I would have been snooty because I came out here and I had to drive a taxi to make ends meet. Uh, I had to try to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners to make ends meet. Uh, I had to do a floor cleaning thing. I had to drive a truck for a while. So... It it never came easy, but it, it it came nicely when I discovered that I could do accents. But I would never take anything for granted, and uh, my attitude is gratitude. It always is. I had my kids late. Uh, I had Adam when I was sixty four. Of course, Katrina might have had something to do with this. Uh, I had Joshy when I was when I was sixty eight. What did I say? I, yeah, I had Adam when I was sixty four. I had Joshy when I was. 68. So I'm grateful for all of these wonderful things that that have happened, that are happening, and hopefully that will happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to just keep keep going, keep doing it. You are, and you will. So I, I want to thank you again for being here tonight, and, and you've got the gold key. We, we'll have you back, and we'll do some more yakking on the air. 
And I'd like to thank everybody who's listening in as well, because, of course, without you guys, I'd be kind of stirring a lonely cauldron here. Um, so, Bernie, stay on the line, if you can, for just a couple seconds after we get okay. off the air. And sure. until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Martha Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron staring. Any rebroadcast or use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2013. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. <laughs>